Hello, uh, my name is Safit Haji Mohamedovic. Welcome to the SOAS University of London Festival of Ideas and welcome to our panel Encounters and Border Crossings towards a post-lockdown anthropology. We're very much looking forward to um, presenting some of snippets of our work to you and then having uh, quite a bit of time for a conversation with you. Um, so this uh, little panel started really from our shared current experiences of reduced social proximity, um, recognizing really that uh, in different ways, all of us, all the panelists have been doing an anthropology of lockdown and encounter uh, in our work before the pandemic. Uh, so the somewhat experimental brief for this panel uh, was to build on a single image uh, and offer uh, a short rumination on encounters and border crossings in our own work and through our own ethnographies. So we will have a succession of 10 minute presentations. Again, as I said, each relying on a single image. Um, and uh, you will, um, I have presentations on encounters over dinner, over sports, across species, uh, over time, and across borders. Um, please also check our Xenia series. Uh, it's a new series of seminars in anthropology of travel, tourism, and pilgrimage. Uh, to find out more about this series and register for some uh, events that speak about uh, uh, these some of the topics that we also consider today, please visit zeniaseries.com. Xenia is spelled X-E-N-I-A. Uh, so we will, after the presentations, have a good hour or so for the Q&A. Uh, please do use the Q&A function rather than the chat. Uh, apparently this will uh, help us record all of your questions and keep better track of them. Um, and we invite you to explore together with us the multiple affective and political registers of encounters. Um, so our little intervention really is a call to unpack the notions of proximity and distance uh, through ethnographic research and consider what novel orientations might come about after this sort of global and shared moment of disorientation. Um, as the first uh, speaker, uh, I would like to invite uh, Jeff DeVito, who will tell us something about encounters over dinner. Good morning. Thank you, Safet, and thank you all for joining us. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Thanks for tuning in today. I am an anthropologist by training, and over the last 15 years, I have spent more days on cruise ships than I have on land. Um, by its very nature, a cruise ship is something that passes through borders, spends a lot of time at sea, and gets people from all over the world who have come from all over the world together to travel. The one thing that the people have in common on a cruise ship who are passengers is that they have all bought into the idea of taking a trip together that goes to multiple destinations. At last count, there's somewhere between 310 and 340, depending on how you classify them, cruise ships sailing around the world with a combined capacity of just under 540,000. That means that this table that we're looking at right now is one of approximately 125,000 tables that up until the lockdown was occupied on a daily basis and was the source of great revelry three times a day, sometimes four. I've been researching and working in the cruise industry for a long time. And one of the roles that I've had as I've been on ships sailing around the world is to go to dinner. And that sounds like a pretty interesting job and as an anthropologist, I've been able to collect stories and find similarities because I've done something called hosting a dinner over 300 times. And that means that I walk into a dining room and have dinner with anywhere from four to 10 possible strangers, possible people I've met earlier in the cruise ship. And I sit down and I host a dinner. What I wanna to talk to you about today is the arc 
of these dinners. And with these over 300 dinners, I've found some similarities. As an anthropologist, we often tell people about worlds that they're unfamiliar with, or in this case is dinner. We've all had dinner before, so this is something you're familiar with, but we're gonna look at it a little bit differently. I walk into the dining room as part of my job and I meet a seating hostess. The seating hostess will direct me to a table very similar to the one that you see here. And I'll be advised to stand up and wait until my other guests have joined me. I won't know much about these guests usually, but I'll look around and there'll be little cards that'll be on the side of each person's plate, similar to a wedding or some other extravagant festival. I'll wonder who these folks will be. I wonder where they're from. And I'll wonder most of all, what our encounters are going to be like over dinner. Will we talk about politics? Will we talk about wealth? Will we talk about the destinations and our view of the world that we have seen that day, the days before? Or will we talk about our anticipation about our upcoming cruise ports that we'll go into? Slowly, people will start to arrive and I'll shake hands. In this lockdown economy that we're in now, it's hard to imagine shaking hands. The idea terrifies me at the moment. It was such a part of my regular life for so many years. As they walk in and shake hands and introduce each other, the guests at the table casually size each other up and size me up as well. The irony in all this is that I'm the host and they're honored to come eat dinner with me because of my role on the cruise ship. But were I to join them at any other point in life, any other point in their business, any other social situation, I very unlikely would be welcome because I'm not in their economic class. I'm not in their social class. The one thing that I have is a status on board this floating container. Eventually everyone will arrive, they'll sit down and I'll sit down and we'll look at each other and wonder what we're going to talk about. And that's where I become a conductor of this culinary carnival that's about to take place. A waiter will come very quickly and pour everybody some wine. What an interesting thing that is. People will talk about the wine. This is an opportunity for people to size each other up as far as their familiarity with wines around the world. Most often people will comment that this wine is delicious. I, for one, am in charge of tasting this wine. My palate knows nothing of the finer things of viticulture, but as with always, I'll say it's acceptable and lovely and encourage the others to take part in this gathering and this compliment. The waiter that comes over to serve this wine is a very interesting role here because while I and the waiter have very much in common, at that moment, I'm isolated from this waiter and become part of the social structure of the table. The waiter becomes mere scenery for a moment. Maybe someone will ask a question, where are you from? What country do you live in? What did you do today? The waiter and I offer each other glances as if to say, we're in this together. We're gonna to get through this. And I offer a glance that apologizes for the fact that I'm being served at a moment and that makes me feel very uncomfortable. The menus come, people look over this and they make choices about what they're going to dine with. This is not different than a usual restaurant. However, this is where the conversation starts to occur between folks. They'll look, they'll choose something, Someone will start complimenting about what they are commenting on what they had the night before, what they're looking forward to having the following day. There's a tension that exists because we haven't quite gotten into the conversations. I dread the moment that someone asks me a question about my personal life, asks me a question about who I am outside of this environment where I'm momentarily special to them. I'll tell a story that I've told hundreds of times before as if on autopilot. And I'll look at their faces wondering if they're judging me or if I in fact am the one that is doing the judging. Very simply after that, I'll lead a conversation and ask people in a circular manner about how their day was. Why are they here? What do they do? And in this whole small talk of performance, we're trying to suss out what we'll talk about after the next course arrives. Gosh forbid somebody orders a vegetarian option on the menu, which will cause others carnivores to judge and ask, why are you eating that? What's going on with you? Why did you make that choice? As the second course comes and pleasantries move into somewhat more substantial conversation, 
I'll ask people about how their day was and what they saw in the various destinations. At this point, the people from different countries, maybe Australia, maybe France, maybe the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa, start to discuss their days with a little bit of confidence, but also some uneasiness, wondering how their day stacked up to the ones around them. Had they seen the same things? Had they enjoyed the same moments? And what did they think about these countries that they visited, these ports, these destinations, in relationship to the places that they're from? At this point, the conversation can lead to strong opinions, let's just say, perspectives about destinations versus re of residence. If we're in a destination where there's a particular impoverished angle, perhaps people will discuss how they felt about that. How did you feel about this poverty there? How does this compare to the poverty in your neighborhoods back home? Often heavy judgment is put down about the cultures that folks had only had the opportunity to be tourists in for a few moments. But at the dinner table, they're all experts on everything that they've seen and everything that they've experienced. The third course will come, the main course. And at this point, we're now right into it. The wine has been flowing. Maybe a couple of whiskeys have happened between a few gentlemen or women around the table. And I dread what's about to happen. Someone will ask me as an American, how do I feel? about politics. Politics is a no-no at the dinner table, no matter where you are, especially now. But in this environment where I oftentimes do not share the political views of those that I'm dining with, but yet have a job to perform, an illusion to perpetuate, I choose my words carefully. Usually the words about politics when asked, how do you feel about the United States president? Go something like this. Jeff, how do you feel about your president? This dessert looks delicious, I respond. After the desserts are cleared, we linger at the table, sizing up how long we actually wanna to be together as strangers. Did we make connections that are meaningful? Are we now friends? Or are we excited to go somewhere else, far away from each other, but have that casual nod when we meet in the hallways throughout the rest of our voyage? The hotel director will come by at some point and ask people how they were doing. And sometimes rather than ask them how their dinner was, they'll say words like, wasn't that a wonderful experience you had over dinner tonight? We use positives to reinforce what we're selling. And what we're selling is fantasy. We're not necessarily selling meaningful conversation between parties, but we're selling an illusion. And through that illusion, we find that we actually do create meaning and that's special. The chef will come by posing for pictures and others will compliment him on what a fantastic dinner his team has made. Now these tables are empty. They're inhabited by the few crew members that are able to be successful enough to stay on these ships right now. They'll dine at these tables only to find out in a few months after the lockdown when cruising returns that these are areas that they're forbidden from encountering again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And what fantastic timing. It's 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Um, I would now like to invite Linda Covenson uh, to tell us about encounters over sports. Uh, just trying to find out how to share my screen. Uh. Uh, just click Sorry. on the button at the bottom of the screen. Yes, that's it. Where is it gone? There it is. Um, can you see anything? Oh, no, we did. <laughs> that's it. Yes. Okay. Um, encounters over sport. The UK has a relationship with sport that is so much part of the cultural heritage of the nation that even the daily news broadcast feature items from the sports desk and the written press devote the back pages to sport. The television broadband and satellite providers have whole subscriber packages with separate channels for individual sports. The UK government recognises this combination 
in having a department of digital, culture, media and sport. All the sports outlined in the image, courtesy of Al Jazeera, are the big players in terms of broadcast revenue and the commercial sustainability of these particular sports leagues or competitions is codependent and reply and rely on the participation of the sportsmen and sportswomen and the spectating public. But what happens when this commercial sustainability itself encounters a dramatic challenge such as the COVID-19 global pandemic of 2020? In the UK, how the virus spread has been linked to sport, to large gatherings, super spreader events at the beginning of the pandemic. Economic pressures to maintain normality saw Liverpool FC versus Atletico Madrid play their Champions League match on the 11th of March with 52,000 fans, including 3,000 from Madrid when Spain was already in partial lockdown. Several deaths from COVID-19 have been attributed to this match. The Guardian reported that cases began to climb in the week following the match in Liverpool. At the same time, on the 10th of March, the four day horse racing Cheltenham Festival began with just over a quarter of a million spectators overall, including 68,000 race goers at the track for the Cheltenham Gold Cup. This event attracted 20,000 visitors from Ireland and was allowed by the government to go ahead, as was rugby at Twickenham and Murrayfield in Scotland. Subsequent COVID-19 cases and deaths that were diagnosed in the weeks after track back to the travel that took place by the spectators attending these events. Contact tracing and tracking of cases and quarantine had by this point been only for returning travellers from already infected areas abroad, namely China, Italy and France. And testing was soon to only be available for those needing hospital admission. Total lockdown in the UK, declared on March the 23rd, prevented all but essential travel for the population, requiring all retail businesses to close except for food and chemists. All sporting events at this point came under this pandemic jurisdiction and ceased. Not only in the UK, but as COVID-19 outbreaks escalated in other countries, international competition was prevented by a global shutdown of air transport and travel restrictions. Sport, like any other business operation, had an unprecedented cessation of trading brought about by the declaration of the pandemic. There was an immediate assessment of who in the industry this would affect. Behind sport, there is a structure that not only includes the athlete participants, but the officials, spectators, broadcast and print media, social media, business corporations as sponsors, working with sports governing bodies at all levels, and of course, people on low incomes employed on sessional work at sports venues. Would they qualify for furlough payments from the government? What would happen to sports events? Postponement, cancellation, completion of leagues or rescheduling? Crisis planning could impact on results, rankings, positions, prizes if wrong decisions were made. Here in the UK, the government set out guidelines to follow and of course the key factor was to prevent the spread of the virus and keep people safe. Operational changes had to be considered in becoming COVID-19 secure and travel and quarantine arrangements had to be established for sports teams from other countries. For example, players from the West Indies and, and the Pakistan cricket teams and their English opponents quarantined together in hotels and training facilities linked to just two venues in Southampton and Manchester, allowing for the different forms of cricket matches to take place. No spectators were permitted and press and broadcast media personnel were included in this quarantine bubble. Subsequently, the model was used so that other sports could resume safely with officials and trainers, etc., included in each team's secure bubble. 2020 should have been the 32nd Olympic Games in Tokyo the mega sports event of the year, with the cost of cancelling estimated at $6 billion, um, it was postponed after protocol changes. COVID-19 started in the Northern Hemisphere in China in January 2020, with the global spread initially to Western Europe, where it was winter going into spring and summer. Most sport played in these countries during this period had competitions that usually climax as the seasons change. In the lead up to the Olympics, this is the time that individual athletes have to meet qualifying standards to compete through international and national championships. For some athletes, next year will be too late 
and their training schedules have been put on hold. How will their fitness be maintained during the total lockdown with an individual's right to exercise different in every country or region and dictated by the government? Daily news bulletins still kept their sport teams, uh, sport items relating to the progress being made with different sports to start competing again. Some pole vaulters managed to organize a virtual competition from their own gardens shared on video conferencing. Others reporting on how the sportsmen and women were adapting to different ways of participating without spectators and how training uh, recommenced that included a team bonding video game playing competition whilst in quarantine. Sports fans also had access to countless replayed matches from the past archives. Those disinterested in sport may ask, why is so much focus being placed on the return of sport? After all, what does sport bring to the economy? Well, the answer is that the big money is on sports multi-billion dollar worldwide industry involving sponsorship, media and broadcast rights, grants and subsidies, huge professional player salaries and large transfer fees through player agents. It is for the survival of the non-league sports teams with non-salaried or part-time players that are the big fish, elite sports and the minnows and the financial support of the fan spectator base, whether by in-person attendance at a match event or in the consumption of sport via the subscription media or internet channels, advertising or marketing of branded kit. Chris Gratton in Global Economics of Sport explored how sport has been transformed into financially rewarding business. It was calculated that the potential revenue loss was in total $1.3 billion for the English Premier League, um, as you can see in the um, image, um, to the season's end, and was the individual sport league likely to suffer the most. This was based on the impact of COVID-19 in the season 2019 to 20, but of course at that time there was no indication of how long it would take to return to normal. League matches were halted in March when lockdown occurred. The industry then worked on plans to re recommence and complete the season to determine the league winner and the teams to be relegated. The biggest prize in football is the guaranteed income from the promotion into the Premier League. Research from Deloitte in June 2019 estimated at £170 million the playoff final is known as the richest game in football, with parachute payments over the following two years. It was won this year, eventually, by Leeds United. I want to use the football team that I support as an example. As the pandemic began, Crystal Palace were mid-table in the English Premier League. As the COVID-19 lockdown ended, sport was allowed to start again on the 1st of June. The players returned to the training grounds awaiting a behind closed doors fixture list for the postponed matches. The Premier League worked with the broadcasters, their main revenue source, made a rule change that allowed live broadcast of matches, including on terrestrial TV. In fact, Crystal Palace had the honour of hosting the first Premier League match to be shown live on BBC TV since 1988. The match against Bournemouth was watched by an audience of 3.9 million and Palace won two goals to nil. All Premier League matches were shown live, utilising the satellite cable and internet app channels, and the subscription fees were waived for these broadcasts. The experience of watching matches on TV with no crowds present was as strange for the fans as was for the players having a virtually silent stadium. Fan chants and songs have long been recorded as matches are played and are used in the gaming industry for virtual reality soccer games as background soundtrack. As matches were screened, these recordings were made available to enhance the reality for the fans, being home ground specific. You could clearly hear our song, Glad All Over, when Palace were playing at home. Empty seats were used for advertising for the team sponsors and also, also to support the massive Black Lives Matter campaign that had occurred during the lockdown period, as well as each club's thanks to the um, National Health Service. Televised football became a vehicle to promote the players' participation in the Black Lives Matter protests by them taking the knee at the start of every match. Some clubs used enlarged photos of individual fans placed on each of the lower tier seats and the PA system played the team entry music even though there was no crowd. Part of the routine though for the players. 
there was an option to watch the matches without the crowd noise overlay, and then you could actually hear the players' shouts to each other. This continued the, until the Premier League season was completed, with teams playing twice a week through the summer closed season. For football fans, this was a partial return to their passion, and it was possible to watch up to four matches back to back if you had the channels. Live match coverage is normally only provided by Sky or BT Sport, and never for a 3 p.m. kickoff. Historically, as most matches start at that time, and fans might watch on TV rather than attend a ground. TV and sponsorship money will, to some extent, more than mitigate for the loss of match day income, which for many clubs in the Premier League is their smallest revenue earner overall, Maguire wrote in the I newspaper. However, lower league and non-league clubs don't benefit in the same way and rely on spectators through the turnstiles. The Premier League is a wealthy organisation and made some contribution to support some of those teams to prevent bankruptcy. Palace moved up the table with another win in their match, their next match. However, their great restart didn't continue and they ended up safe but mid-table. The spectator experience changed, but some things remained the same with club social media feeds, virtual programmes, notification team news, fantasy leagues, and in the very short close season, the dealings in the transfer market. Returning fans to watch live sport in COVID-19 secure environments and plans for 1,000 fans to go to watch in family groups, spaced out to meet social distancing, was due to move forward from just a few test grounds on the 1st of October. But rising COVID-19 cases and local um, COVID-19 alert levels have put that on hold. We can't predict yet what the normal return of sport will be post lockdown. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Linda. And from the world of sports, we are moving to interspecies encounters. And I would like to invite Julie Scott to join us and share her image. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Safet. Um, yes. Um, my name's uh, Julie Scott and I'm a social anthropologist and for the past 30 years I've been working on questions to do with travel and tourism and intangible cultural heritage. And um, but the, but the encounter that I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is from, um, not really from that sort of professional area, but from something else that I've been involved in over the past five years. And this is an encounter across species. So I'm going to share my picture with you. And um, let's see. Uh, Let's see how that works. Hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Okay. So um, I bought my first beehive when I moved to a village in rural Kent about five years ago, along with a nucleus of bees. That's a small box that contains a queen and her retinue of worker bees. And they set about expanding the population and filling up the hive. At the same time, I was introduced to a whole new human world of beekeeping. The thriving local beekeepers association holds monthly meetings throughout the year. In summer, we sit on plastic chairs in a field next to the association's apiary and we discuss bees whilst consuming tea and cake, swapping the association's library books, which are all about bees, and holding raffles. In winter, we do the same in a village hall. Honey competitions, classes, and exams related to all things bee, national and international conferences, bee safaris involving visits to apiaries in Britain and abroad, all of these form the staples of a human world of beekeeping that's almost as absorbing as that of the bees themselves. With the onset of COVID, all of these activities were abruptly suspended, although some of them have reconfigured themselves online. And the beekeeper has been thrown back on that essential core relationship with their bees. I suppose 
my initial decision to embark on beekeeping was at least partly motivated by species guilt. We all know that bees are having a hard time of it and that human activity is at the root of their difficulties. Pesticide use, the destruction of wildflower meadow habitats, the industrialized pollination of monocrops such as Californian almonds, I could go on. So it was with a warm glow of altruism that I set about establishing a small apiary of two hives at the bottom of the garden. But something happened to the bees over the first couple of years. In the second year, they seemed to develop a vicious streak, embarking on search and destroy missions to sting not only anyone who came into our garden, but also our neighbors in their gardens. My reaction to bee stings became progressively more severe, ending in an incident of near anaphylactic shock requiring treatment by paramedics. My GP issued me with two EpiPens and a warning, either to give up bees or to undergo a course of immunotherapy to desensitize me to their venom. This has involved a three year routine of visits to the allergy department at Guy's Hospital in London, where I have received shots of bee venom in increasing doses and spent the one hour recovery time under observation in the clinic, discussing with the scores of other beekeepers who are undergoing the same treatment, what is happening to the bees and the madness of carrying on with them. The image I've chosen here shows me after a battering by bees, but this was not the incident that introduced me to the local ambulance service. This particular encounter occurred several weeks later, and I've noticed that in relating it, I've always been quick to point out that it was not my bees that did it, God forbid, but that it happened when I visited a friend's bees and carelessly left an opening in my protective veil. Clearly, I'm suggesting the existence of a bond between me and my, in inverted commas, bees. A relationship of reciprocity. I care for the bees. I provide them with shelter. I monitor and treat any diseases or mite infestations. I top up their food stocks so that they don't starve over the winter and I protect them from the predations of badgers, woodpeckers, mice and wasps. In return, I take some of their honey in early and late spring. I make candles and ointments out of their old and excess wax, or at least what I consider to be excess. Of course, the bees haven't agreed to any of this. Essentially, I steal their precious honey topping it up with an inferior inverted sugar syrup or sugar solution and creating more work for them to turn it into stores. Every time I open up the hive for inspection, I risk causing damage, injuring or losing the queen or inadvertently killing individual bees who get squashed between the boxes of the hive as I restack them. Personal guilt piled on top of the weight of species guilt if this is a relationship of reciprocity, it's clearly an uneasy one. Despite my attempts to domesticate the bees by weaving a web of reciprocity, empathy and affection around my relations with them, they remain resolutely feral and irreducibly other. At the height of the summer, a hive may contain 50 to 60,000 bees. Each summer bee lives for about six weeks, and the winter bees for about six months. So although the colony, and hopefully the queen, remains constant, there is a perpetual turnover of its membership. I've come to see beekeeping essentially as a game of chess with the hive mind. I read the frames and try to interpret the bees' comings and goings in an attempt to anticipate and head off swarming which can drastically reduce the size and strength of the colony. Beekeepers usually do this either by deceiving the bees into thinking that they have already swarmed or by destroying new queen cells that appear as a prelude to swarming. Caring for the bees has turned me into a killer. 
Sometimes this is collateral damage. At other times I kill in cold blood as I pick off one by one the hordes of wasps who try to overwhelm the bees in later summer and rob them of their stores. I do see the irony of this. I, after all, am also helping myself to the bees' honey. And furthermore, I'm not allergic to wasp venom, so that seems a bit ungrateful. But perhaps I'm also channeling some of the ruthless characteristics of the worker bees, who will kill off their queen once she starts to fail, and in late summer throw out all of the male drones to fend for themselves as they prepare the colony to survive the winter. Prehistoric rock and cave paintings of bees, honeycomb and honey hunting expeditions indicate an association between human beings and bees going back many millennia, which humans have worked into their mythologies, art, music, folklore, and in the language of the UNESCO Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage, their understanding of nature and the cosmos. Bees have become symbols of industry and qualities of hard work and organisation. Telling the bees, sharing news of births, marriages and deaths was a long-standing tradition of beekeepers in Europe and New England, in America, and traditionally on the death of a beekeeper, their hives would be dressed in black. Yet human attempts to anthropomorphise and co-opt bees into the world, of, into the human world of meaning never fully succeed. My encounter with bees forced me to rethink my ideas of reciprocity across the species boundary, which human beings have a tendency to interpret on their terms and in their favour. It gave me a new appreciation of the otherness that resists attempts to domesticate and make familiar, of how human beings situate themselves in relation to other species and the planet and of the need to listen to what the bees are telling us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, for that wonderful talk. Um, and I guess now it's time for me <laughs> uh, to share my screen and my image. Um, so my name is Safet Haji Mohamedovic. I currently work um, with the Cambridge Interfaith Program based in the Faculty of Divinity of the University of Cambridge, but also uh, I'm one of the co-conveners uh, together with Jeff, Linda, Tom, Sania, and Reza uh, of the summer school in the anthropology of travel, tourism, and pilgrimage at SAS. Um, I'm an anthropologist of uh, sacred landscapes and syncretism and time. Time is what I will be talking about today. And uh, most of my long-term research as anthropologists like to say uh, was conducted in Southeastern Bosnia in the Dinaric Highlands. And this is what I will be sharing with you or a snippet of this I'll be sharing with you today. Now, let me just see, play from current slide and that's it. Uh, so in this image, what you can see uh, are the people of Agatsko uh, in the Southeastern Bosnian Highlands uh, on Elijah's day, the 2nd of August in 2012. Uh, they're in front of Sopot, a natural spring rushing from limestone, uh, very close to the Kula Mosque. Um, so sort of the central mosque in a village around which a lot of hamlets are uh, located. Most of these people, and people who are not in the picture, uh, thousands of people who have arrived on this day, they actually live in exile and in various diasporas. They come back to Gatsko and to this place for a single day, for St. Elijah's Day, to briefly dive into the homely temporal and spatial frames uh, of the communal encounters from which they were exiled. Now, repeatedly voiced this year by people under COVID-19 lockdowns is one form or another of temporal disorientation. I have certainly succumbed to this myself on more occasions than I care to admit. I have even asked my Google Assistant speaker, okay, Google, what day of the week is it? 
It's certainly not for the lack of work. Today is Thursday. And you see my Google Assistant is responding that it's Thursday. Uh, but it's certainly not for the lack of work, but often quite the opposite. In the absence of habitual temporal patterns, we may find ourselves working longer hours over the weekends, falling into the vortex of non-time. Uh, one of my colleagues, actually one of our panelists today, I won't reveal which one, said on Monday when we met over Zoom, time means nothing. Is this a peculiar thing to say? Time means nothing. I find it somewhat less surprising because it confirms some of my hypotheses based on research in Bosnia. We are often frightened of artificial narratives about people's lives. I had nightmares even to admit to you whilst writing my book on waiting in Southeastern Bosnian highlands, asking myself, granted, this is a story I craft, but is it anyone else's story really? These are real fears as they should be of speaking over others or speaking one's self over others. Uneasiness and perhaps even nightmares, I would suggest, are important in our quest to decolonize knowledge, a quest celebrated by SOAS and this festival. So it was quite important for me to find out that not only do ethnographies and other ruminations about the space-time discontinuum after cataclysmic events share some of my findings, but also that the current lockdown suggests that we need to take the questions of time and temporality much more seriously. People without time, without time of specific structure, of specific quality. The initial confusion, perhaps even helplessness, may be replaced with attempts to establish different patterns of our life worlds imbued with temporariness of existing in the meantime. I need not remind us that individuals, groups, and entire landscapes around the world have been and continue to be distemporalized in different and often much more violent ways. Think of the work of Ruba Saleh from SOS on Palestinian refugee camps. She considers the temporariness and precarity that became a permanent transgenerational horizon. Saleh thinks about the political qualities of such persistent temporariness in the struggle against the normalization of the occupation of Palestine. Palestinians frequently hang on their walls the keys of the houses from which they were exiled. The keys are orientational, just like a person incarcerated in a solitary cell might count the days and the weeks by scratching tally marks into the wall. Time is never absolute, Einstein taught us. It depends on the object's speed and acceleration. The so-called proper time describes the clock moving in the same frame of reference as the observer. And anthropologists could reply to the physicists by making the same statement about the perception of time. Indeed, time is never absolute. It is determined by the motion relative to the frames of reference. When we lose these frames or are exiled from them, the coffee get togethers with the neighbor, the rhythms of going to the market, plowing the field, celebrating a feast or visiting a local library, what happens then? Following this orientation, we often become conscious of the habitual frames of reference. When Steph Janssen, an anthropologist from the University of Manchester, wrote about the temporal entrapments and the meantime of the Sarajevo suburb of Dobrinja, he noticed that people still waited for the public buses to arrive on time, continually complaining about the disorganized post-war state and desiring the supposedly punctual Yugoslav bus arrivals. Yet, when the meantime is protracted, it starts to solidify its own habitual temporal structures. These time spaces may continue or become longed for even after the meantime is formally said to have ended. I can't tell you how many times I've heard nostalgic narratives about the spirit of cultural events in the besieged Sarajevo of the 90s, 
or how people developed rituals of proximity huddled in the basements of their buildings during the bombardments during the siege. And I think of images of the London underground stations during the Second World War, people lying next to one another on top of each other, certainly frightened, the stale sense of humidity permeating their nostrils, the nervous murmur of conversations ominously punctured by thunderous convulsions above ground. Here's a historical fact. Deep down in uh, Highgate Station, very close to my apartment, the American TV host, Jerry Springer, who, whom you may know, was born in 1944, as many members of his family were killed in Nazi concentration camps across Europe. I wondered, what does time look like in the London underground in 1944? Does it exist? Where is time of our right now in the Yemenite city of Sana'a right now? Do clocks move there? During my field work in the southeastern Bosnian highlands, I have noticed that the few refugees who had supposedly returned spatially to their homes have, however, not also returned temporally. It wasn't home. That place could not be home because space is temporally inflected. Home was in the past, possibly also the future, but not in the present. Regained spatial coordinates could not make up for the fact that the rhythms and temporal orientations of communal life had been pulled apart. The frame of reference could not be completed simply with, for example, a reconstructed house. Something else was needed. The first temporal piece of heritage that these returnees restored was the day of Elijah, the harvest feast in August. Elijah's day used to be the biggest occasion for get-togethers, flirtation, singing, athletic competition, food, dance, drinks, and even fistfights. It released all the energy accumulated during the long winter and the difficult summer labor in the field. It was also a feast shared by the local Muslims and Christians who would end up divided by a violent nationalist program of ethnic cleansing. Elijah's day, was every kind of encounter. It was time as such. When one Elijah's day ended, time itself was recalibrated and oriented anew towards the next Elijah's day. After the 1990s war, Elijah's day became the only day when the exiled people from all over the world would come back, as you see in this image. Time seemed to be, if for a moment, regained. After their leaving, the few people who remained scattered around the Gatsko villages would retreat into the time space of home. Their narratives were saturated with the past of the landscape. They seldom spoke about the war, almost as if that period of their lives lacked language. In the absence of habitual relations, how can one speak time? Their toolbox for time reckoning was not really equipped to deal with the unwanted absence of community. And when the war was mentioned, it somehow always came back to the encounters with the old landscape. Puzzled as we are by the notion of time, the familiar stranger, we have tried in many ways to grapple with some definition. In his fourth century confessions, St. Augustine of Hippo remarked, for what is time? Who can easily and briefly explain it? But what in speaking do we refer to more familiarly and knowingly than time? And certainly we understand when we speak of it. We understand also when we hear it spoken of by another. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain to him who asks, I know not. I wonder what St. Augustine would have of my reply. Time, I suggest, based on all my observations thus far, is one's position relative to encounter. How else would we judge time's measure of proximity? That something is fast-paced or pro prolonged, 
that something is behind or in front of us, often or never, eternal or perishable. Whether it's encounter with one's aging skin, with a changing landscape, a coffee with a friend, the punctuality of nomadic people on the horizon, the rhythms of the state apparatus, or an encounter with the weather, the waiting for an exuberant feast, the nervous stillness in the meantime of a pandemic, a loneliness faced with a clock ticking loudly. We sometimes think of the arrow or the tunnel of time, regressing and progressing inevitably away from us. But that is only because the past and the future appear, appear as increasingly devoid of encounter for our bodies. A chronic lack of intimacy results in temporal distance. As we've learned from Eric Wolf and Johannes Fabian and others, anthropologists have done the same to exotic faraway places. They denied their dynamic time, arrested them in some imagined spatiocultural stillness. The early anthropological volumes speak volumes about the deficiency of encounter. Precisely because it is a dynamic, time is not a continuum for the people of Gatsko. It warps and creates past futures, skipping over the encounterless present, where time means nothing, or at least nothing worth attuning one's body to. This is a glimpse into what I would hope a post-lockdown anthropology could learn, building, as it were, on this phenomenological exercise without planning of the lockdown and its temporal disorientation, that the possibility of speaking time is a matter of that which is encountered, a limit of our dynamic horizons of social touch. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I would now like to stop sharing my screen and invite Professor Tom Selvin to join us and tell us about Encounters Over Borders. Thank you, Safed, very much for your wonderful talk. Um, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, which is not working perhaps too well. Uh, screen, screen sharing has stopped as the shared window is closed. Yes, perhaps you can restart sharing your screen and then if it's, uh, is it a PowerPoint? It's one, a PowerPoint with one image. Yes, so when you start sharing your screen, I think the PowerPoint will already be there, most probably. Uh, yes, and now can you move it back and forth to, to the image? Uh, just go back, I think, one slide. Um, um, so if you can share the same PowerPoint uh, again. How was that? Could you uh, try sharing the same PowerPoint uh, again? Because you've stopped sharing right now. Oh, I, I can actually see it, but uh, maybe you can't. Uh, no, we cannot. Okay. Yeah. So try again, share screen. Yes, click on the PowerPoint if you see it. Do you see it? No. Um, I think you can try and find it. Um, so it, you should have a number of whiteboard, iPhone, iPhone, it says optimize screen, sh screen share for video clip. So you have nothing, perhaps if you just click on sharing your desktop and then you can share with us your desktop. Um, okay. And now open the PowerPoint. Um, yes, it's right there. Uh, would you like me to share my screen? Oh, there it is, there it is. So just share that slide, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to read it, um, and we might as well keep the keep the image there. Um, so I'm going to start 
Uh, I'm an anthropologist um, that have uh, I've been specialising in travel, tourism, and pilgrimage um, in the past uh, few years, um, and I work also at the University of Bethlehem in Palestine, um, and it is about Palestinian um, uh, initiatives that I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> So our SOAS Festival of Ideas comes at a time when throughout large areas of the global north and south there is a growing movement towards the decolonization of the higher education curriculum. One aspect of this movement involves the promotion of encounters between neighbours in different localities, be they in villages, cities, states or other kinds of groupings and the development of cross-border regional political and cultural systems in which all citizens of a region can enjoy equal rights freely to live, work and travel. The aim of this talk is to describe work that is going, going along on these lines in one of SOAS's partners in the Eastern Mediterranean, the University of Bethlehem, Palestine. We will do this by considering how the work of faculty and students completing their master's degree in the anthropology of travel, tourism and pilgrimage um, at Bethlehem reflect and refract the inspiration deriving from a regional initiative composed by specialists in tourism and pilgrimage from the countries of the Fertile Crescent, including Palestine itself, together with academics from Harvard University to reconstruct the route taken by the Patriarch Abraham and his family from what we now know as the Persian Gulf to Canaan, in the form of a walking and hiking trail known as Abraham's Path, Masa Ibrahim. As noted, founded in 2006 by scholar activists from Palestine and Harvard, amongst other places, the aim at the beginning was to make a contribution to regional coexistence by stressing the social and cultural linkages in the area symbolized by the life and travels of a patriarch revered by all. Put briefly, the aim of the trail was and remains to encourage walkers and hikers to move through a region comprising modern Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Israel and Egypt, presently much of it beset by multiple multiple conflicts. The organisation and operation of the trail is arguably flourishing most effectively in contemporary Palestine and it is the Palestinian leg of the trail that forms the background to the present talk. Issues of cross-border encounters in Palestine need, obviously enough, to be placed within the frame of the occupation of Palestine by the State of Israel. Efforts to consider the organisation of the hospitality industry, the preservation and advancement of cultural heritage, the strengthening of Palestinian identity, the role of tourism and pilgrimage in economic development, and all the other things travel and tourism professionals discuss, is not possible without considering the facts and consequences of the occupation, the effect of settlements, bypass roads, complex systems of identity cards, targeted assassinations, house demolitions, multiple checkpoints, and the physical and symbolic violence of the wall as it careers and crashes through the villages and towns of the country from north to south multiplied in Bethlehem itself, with all the subsidiary walls surrounding the tomb of the matriarch Rachel, and so on. Jacobson's 213 account of the occupation as a prime example of the role of humiliation in international conflict is wholly convincing. How can Masai Ibrahim and related work possibly have any effect in such a situation, is the question. There have been a number of studies of the Massar, the most comprehensive being that by Patricia Selick in her paper last year, 2019, called Boots on the Ground, 
Walking in Occupied Palestinian Territory. A very fine title. Having walked the 330 kilometers long trail from north to south with groups of fellow hikers, she concludes to quote her, this social non-movement connects places along the trail and beyond, walkers to each other and the people they encounter and plural narratives of effective solidarity. These findings unsettle the idea of securitized territorial solutions and invite the possibility of continuous open geographies. The, the present paper operates in a slightly different but complementary way by first looking at Abraham himself and his family and then considering work that we are doing at Bethlehem University. So we start with Abraham and his family. He travelled, as is well known from the book of Genesis, uh, 700 miles from his birthplace uh, to the borders of present-day Iraq, another 700 miles into Syria, another 800 down to Egypt, and then back into Canaan. And that's, that, that's the journey that we are having in the front of our minds at the moment. He was born and raised in the city of Ur in the Chaldees region of the mountains and valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what we now know as the Persian Gulf. He spoke at least four languages and was a relatively well-to-do trader who would have had routine relationships with comparable traders in East and West Asia, including the subcontinent from which came spices, copper and rice and so on, and the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean, including what is now Lebanon, from which came wood for construction. Ur, his birthplace, was a large Babylonian city containing palaces, temples, law courts, statues and shrines, gardens, and with an effectively organized civil structure. 500 different gods, at least, and goddesses were worshipped there. The Bible tells us that Abraham and his family worshipped one. City dwellers at the time all had nomadic roots and kinship relations, and Abraham was no exception. At an advanced age, some say 75, he felt obliged, following what he perceived to be a divine commandment, to leave Ur and travel on the east side of the river, which involved crossing the Euphrates as Ur was built on the west side, with his wife and family several hundred kilometres north to Padan Aram, the city where his father and brother lived. The first city on his journey was Babylon, where the Tower of Ziggurat, known as the Tower of Babel, associated as this is with a generation of many different languages from the supposedly, mythically supposedly, single global language said to have been spoken at the time of Noah. Along the way of his journey, we see, therefore, cities with multiple gods, exotic palaces with imported luxuries from east and west, markets, different language groups uh, in Mesopotamia, Arcadians, Elamites, Amorites, Hurrians, etc., and all the cities that he passed through uh, cosmopolitan. Clearly, hospitality was a feature of all these cities, as it was, of the countryside around. And Stephanie Daly's archaeological ethnographies of the cities of Mari and Karana show, to quote her, the ancient Mesopotamians recognised that the pleasures of the table are sure indicators of sophistication. The region is renowned for delicious dishes, spicy meats and aromatic confections, with an emphasis on the variety of small, tempting preparations and pleasing the olfactory senses by flavouring with clever combinations of herbs and spices. To invite guests is to make an opportunity to display wealth and good taste and to give hospitality as a mark of duty, generosity, pleasure and power. Uh, which, which reminds us of uh, Jeff's uh, talk um, uh, earlier. And drinking habits included the drinking of beer and wines, uh, lots of vineyards around of many varieties. Feasts and festivals were commonplace uh, and uh, people dressed up and ate uh, and um, uh, people of all ages were there enjoying themselves. There were lots of games of skill in archery and running um, and uh, so on. Abraham had three wives, Sarah, his first, 
um, uh, um, Hagar, uh, uh, supposedly an Egyptian, quotes slave or concubine, and Ketura, um, who's not very well known, but does appear in the Bible, who is said by some commentators to have been Ethiopian. And his most famous children, of course, are Isaac from Sarah and Ishmael from Hagar, and several from Ketura. This pattern of multi-union partnerships was a feature of other biblical patriarchs. A Abraham's grandson, Jacob, for example, husband of Abraham's great-great-granddaughter, Rachel, whose tomb is walled up in Bethlehem, had four wives, Leah, Bilpah, Zilpah, and Rachel herself. The family moved on through the cities of the region, uh, uh, staying in um, uh, Haram for uh, some time before moving uh, southwards uh, to Canaan uh, and then further on to Egypt and then back to Canaan where he bought a, uh, uh, a tomb for himself and his family uh, from a Hittite landowner. All of that uh, is interesting and there are lots of um, things that we can take from it. Um, but, but as we do, we can move on to the work that we are doing at Bethlehem and see how that complements uh, what we've uh, learnt from the, um, uh, the journeys of Abraham in Messiah Ibrahim. First of all, um, he was a trader with very wide regional interests and uh, contacts uh, throughout a very large region, as I've said, from South Asia to the Mediterranean and beyond. And we have one uh, um, student of ours who is doing work on, on this uh, interregional trade. Secondly, all the towns and cities were cosmopolitan and uh, 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 largely welcoming and hosp hospitable. Um, and there is quite a lot of work that we do about the nature of hospitality uh, um, and its importance in a town like uh, Bethlehem, um, Hebron, Nablus and elsewhere. Which, is the, which are the main points of Palestinian tourism and pilgrimage. Um, thirdly, uh, there is a lot of um, aspects of the uh, Massar, which speaks of networks of cooperating villages, and this too forms a subject uh, for uh, 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 work uh, by one uh, student in our group. Um, I've mentioned hospitality, and that goes along with festivals and feasts and uh, winemaking. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, lectures and discussions with Sari Huri, uh, who is quite a well-known or very well-known winemaker, Palestinian winemaker, whose wine is really excellent and competes uh, successfully with the, the best French wine. Um, uh, and of course, uh, eight, uh, number eight, we can see the coexistence of faiths and deities uh, all along the way. And as far as Bethlehem is concerned, uh, one of these aspects of coexistence is her uh, attachment to her father's family gods and godliness, um, uh, which indicates the coexistence of uh, single gods and multiple gods uh, relating to the importance of families. Um, there are references, of course, in the cities through which he went uh, uh, about gardens, and we have a very uh, interesting um, um, analysis and description of a possible garden project in Solomon's Pools near Bethlehem, and we can imagine all sorts of flowers coming from uh, all along the Rift Valley, right from East Africa right up to, to Turkey. Um, work we do on the environment uh, and the, 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 the beauty of the landscape, uh, as Abraham himself uh, uh, talks about uh, in the Bible. The multilingual and multi aspects of identities uh, in Palestine uh, uh, in the same, in the way that uh, Amin Ma'aluf talks about uh, is, is something else that we're studying as we are studying uh, uh, statues, shrines, palaces, music and the arts. And of course, Palestinian cinema, for example, uh, is uh, a, a, a very fine example along with other uh, artistic um, um, aspects that we, uh, that we also know about, like painting, which is definitely uh, a, a, a promotes cross-border cooperation. And all of these aspects uh, uh, are with huge contemporary relevance for decolonizing projects in the region, including the decolonization of the curriculum. So finally, this is the last paragraph, the stories of the biblical and Quranic patriarchs and matriarchs, and I should mention 
that we have a study of the Quranic um, explorations of Abraham and the place of Abraham in, in the Quran and Islam. Um, these stories, led by the life and travels of Abraham, speak of, to use Selick's term, an open geography of the Fertile Crescent region, of the centrality of hospitality and the centrality of festivals and food that go with it, of cosmopolitan and layered histories and intellectual artistic traditions coming from far and wide, of gardens and strong and well-worked-out ideas of urban and rural beauty, and above all, the primacy of attachment to regions and cross-border encounters within them. As such, we could end this talk by concluding that the celebration of all these by the Masa Ibrahim and, the and as well as the creative and simultaneously decisively practical work by postgraduate students in the field of tourism and pilgrimage at Bethlehem University is a compelling response to the violence of the walls and intricate technologies of the occupation and its orientalist and colonial foundations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for that wonderful and important talk. Um, now I would like uh, if you could stop sharing your screen and if all the panelists could turn on their videos, not the microphones as well just yet, but their videos, that would be fantastic. Uh, Tom, could you just uh, stop sharing your screen? If, uh, perfect. Wonderful. So we are all here. Um, unfortunately, we cannot also see uh, all the attendees, um, but uh, some, some of you have introduced yourselves in the chat box and some of you have posed questions either in the chat box or the Q&A uh, facility, which you see on your screen. Please do type questions uh, as we go along as well. Uh, we have a few questions and um, uh, I think perhaps, uh, and you can raise your hand if you would like to reply to the question. I'll, I'll try to moderate a little bit. Perhaps we can try with uh, a question that uh, Subhankar Dutta uh, has posed for all of us really. Um, and that relates very much to the topic of this panel. Subhankar says, my question is in relation to the general idea of ethnography. Do we need to redefine and rethink the idea of ethnography, mostly the one that involves travel to communities and distance, distant people in the post-COVID time? The idea of space, touch, bodily presence, and being there dimension of ethnography has been challenged due to COVID. How to find an alternative in matter of field visits and participatory ethnography? This is such an important question. Um, Tom, would you like to, and then Jeff or? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, it, what, what I would say really is that I think it's a very, very good point. Um, I think that one of the ways in which we are moving uh, in our anthropological work is, uh, as we have talked about quite a lot in this group and in other groups, uh, towards um, slightly auto-ethnographic uh, attempts to understand what we as, uh, uh, as uh, people um, think and feel in the situations in which we find ourselves. Um, I think that uh, in, th in that case, um, uh, the, uh, wh whatever we do really, and um, I mean, Linda's activities with uh, um, Crystal Palace are a very good example of this, and Jeff's uh, activities uh, on his uh, cruise ship are very fine, and we actually um, can m mobilize our anthropological insights, uh, but also place them very um, centrally. Uh, in our own beings, uh, so to speak, uh, in order to come out with uh, interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, analyses. So, uh, and 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 I think that Subhanka is absolutely right. I do I do think we have to rethink, um, and I think that uh, there are all sorts of um, aspects of traditional anthropology, uh, which are uh, really being transcended. Um, one of them. Uh, being the idea that anthropologists study discrete 
groups of people, whether they're in villages or whether they're in so-called tribes or within islands or whatever like this. And somehow or the other, we are there to describe the whole uh, uh, social and cultural, political and economic structure. I think I think all that is gone. Um, uh, and really, I think that we therefore need to, to approach um, our subject from a quite different point of view, as I said, perhaps focusing slightly more on what we feel and think ourselves. Sorry, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I think Tom, I mean, obviously nailed that one. Um, that's, uh, that's right. What I wanted to add was that I think that this would have been an existential crisis for anthropologists um, 30 years ago <clears throat> if they were suddenly without the technology and without the ability to, 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 to do much. Um, we Anthropology over the past 30 years has certainly been training for this moment by pushing the, <clears throat> pushing the envelope, so to speak, on how research is done, whether that's been with uh, more modern approaches, digital research. Um, as Tom said, the idea of studying uh, a new people, uh, as offensive as that term may be now, that, that's so driven really anthropology. But we also have the opportunity to revisit a lot of our work that we've done in the past and reevaluate it, because I think that every bit of ethnographic research is incomplete. And that's that's what it is. So for me, it's an opportunity to go back and to look at classical texts and reframe them, as well as some of the research that I've done and say, okay, was was that now now I can view that in a different perspective than I did when I originally did that research. And so I think the the foundational work that we've all done uh, continues as we re-examine it. And I think that we are able to collect more data now than we had been before to support any type of Eth ethnographic presentations that we that we hope to to achieve. Um, I don't know how, how you feel about that. I think that right now has actually been a, a tremendous blessing to reevaluate the type of research and the importance of this um, because we've been able to be suspended in, in, in time in some ways. Um, we're also through Zoom and through other video conferencing, we're able to meet with people that at a far lesser expense <laughs> than um, would have happened before. And it allows people to conduct research without grants, without the, 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 the need for funding in some ways. Um, we certainly need some more grants, but uh, anyway, that, that, that's what I think. I think this is an opportunity that anthropology has been training for for, for for years, just by the fact that now there's a discipline of the anthropology of travel and tourism, um, anthropology of food, anthropology of medicine, all of these things mean that we're, we're ready for a new approach. But the important thing through this is to collaborate with other social sciences um, as well during this time to have a more holistic ethnographic approach uh, in findings, I think. Uh, Julie, please. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think um, I was struck by um, what you were saying, what Safed was saying in his um, presentation about um, you know, rituals of distance and rituals of proximity and relations of distance and relations of proximity. And I think one of the things that this COVID crisis has done is really um, brought home the, you know, the, the differences between the two and, and, and to start to really kind of um, con conceptualize them um, we find ourselves in an era of, um, of distance in many ways. And that, of course, has implications for our embodied presence and our embodied relations with other people. And I think, you know, um, so I take uh, Tom's point and, and Jeff's point about um, the, you know, in a way, re- investing that kind of you know that, that that attention to the researcher as as actually the research instrument in a way because it changes the sort of nature of participants observation and um you know with, with this sort of barometers of of distance and disembodiedness in a way um um rather than proximity and and, and contact so you know that that is the um, context in which we find ourselves and I think we have to kind of uh, see where it takes us. On the, on the other hand, I, I was very struck um, by the fact that um, 
well, I can't really see my my beekeeper friends that much at the moment, but um, I can get well, I, <laughs> I can get as close as I want to my bees. That may not be very close, mind you. I may not want to be that close to them, but and I have protective clothing and and, and so on on me when I um, when I visit my bees. But uh, you know, I I, I can spend. A, 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 as much time as I want to, as, as closely as I want to, um, with with the bees, you know, and, and 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 that's what kind of got me really thinking about my relationship with them. So maybe this will also um, focus our attention on on, on other kinds of uh, relationship and other kinds of worlds, which I think will be extremely valuable in. Um, a post-COVID era, you know, when we have all this talk about, well, what's the new normal and how does this link to um, climate crisis and the environment and, you know, <laughs> extinction and, and all of these things. I, you know, I think, as Jeff said, we're really due for a shake-up and maybe this will kind of help. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes. Um... I wanted to say that uh, the COVID crisis brings death uh, very close. Um, and we think about death every day. Um, uh, but I think we also need, we are forced uh, in a sense, uh, because death is so close, uh, to think about what life uh, could be. And I think we, we are thinking more uh, also about what life actually means. Um, and uh, there are several people who, uh, I think Paul Nurse, who's the head of the, um, uh, the uh, Institute in, uh, in uh, Houston next to the, the British Library, um, has uh, brought out a book called, uh, I think, The Meaning of Life. And I, I think that these things are, are, are quite important. Uh, in fact, absolutely, extremely important. And I, I, just another point is that it seems to me that... Um, uh, Julie is absolutely right in saying that, of course, the COVID br br uh, makes us spatially distant from one another, but it also makes us spatially close, actually. And uh, the closeness of cross-border cooperation uh, in regions uh, like uh, West Asia and Palestine, Israel and so on, um, is is quite clear. I mean, the, the, uh, um, we we talk about the lost villages uh, uh, of uh, Palestinians, and Safet mentioned the key uh, that uh, people have there, um, and we also have the contribution uh, by uh, an Israeli organisation called Zohrot, who is actually preparing for the return of Palestinian refugees uh, to the region. Um, and 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 uh, and and they are uh, reachable uh, by uh, contemporary technologies in a way that um, uh, form, uh, in former times uh, they perhaps weren't. And of course, the whole of the wall uh, looks even more ridiculous because you can actually uh, call up somebody on the other side of the wall and make uh, contact with them. So several of the uh, several of the old technological ways of um, of keeping people separate uh, are uh, also uh, being challenged uh, with uh, our new technologies in interesting ways, and I think we can go uh, quite a long way with them. Thanks. Um, so the way I see it, yes, of course, these uh, technologies that we've already used many of us in different ways. And I don't know if anybody remembers Skype anymore, um, <laughs> but uh, they are opening up uh, new ways and we're thinking imaginatively of using them. But uh, there's also a danger there, I think, in uh, uh, sort of thinking that they can replace the kind of uh, sort of prolonged proximity that we have nurtured in, uh, in anth as anthropologists in terms of kind of knowledge um, making and uh, the responsibility that this face-to-face -face encounter and prolonged face-to-face -face encounter uh, contains in terms of responsibility to the communities, but also to in the individuals who we uh, meet during our field work. Uh, and sure, it's changing a lot of a lot of stuff for us as researchers, but it's also changing dramatically the kinds of situations that we have engaged with. Uh, it's certainly, you know, if we think about uh, cruise ships, you know, this was a big topic for COVID-19, um, you know, it's dramatically changing that context. It's dramatically changing things for 
uh, refugees and returnees and so on. Um, so I think focusing on perhaps on how it uh, changes these life worlds of our interlocutors uh, will be important. And then we anyway have to negotiate access. We have already always, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to negotiate access. And now it's even more difficult with this kind of fear of, uh, of people who, who may infect you. Um, but, uh, but it's a kind of process that we have to go through to kind of gain the rapport and to gain the confidence. And, you know, now it might involve testing. And it, you know, it's, uh, it wouldn't be the first time anthropologists have to fear of uh, transferring a disease. We know that this was uh, kind of a big problem with measles and lots of things that, you know, uh, killed people before. So, so we have to be careful to, to kind of, uh, to think about how the, the ethical access to, to communities and our interlocutors, I would say. Uh, shall I go on with some other questions? So uh, we have uh, a couple of questions here uh, for Linda. Uh, I will read the first one from our pet. Uh, Linda, can you also see the questions that are posed? Uh, you can unmute yourself perhaps. Yes, I can see the questions. Perfect, so I'll just read out loud the first one and then you can uh, perhaps relate to the second one which is a bit longer and it includes a quote so, which I won't be reading so you can either engage with it um, or however you like comment upon it. The first one is from our Pat. Is it not time to reduce the pay for sports players and managers and think about the poorer countries who cannot even afford food, never mind a bowl? Um. All right, thank, thank you. Um, the answer to that, I, I've been thinking about that. And I, in order to get my, my um, session down to the 10 minutes, I had to leave out a section that I, I had originally put into the discussion. And that was to talk about the impact of um, uh, Marcus Rashford, who is a premiership player for Manchester United, world famous, he's in the England team who came from a very poor background, needing to have free school meals, and uh, as he was growing up and often not knowing where food was coming from. And yet he is earning millions as a football player. Now he has campaigned and is getting political and entering the political debate about the provision for vulnerable children and those children having meal, school meals through the holidays and during the lockdown when they couldn't have access to perhaps their one secure meal a day. Um, I think that the professional footballers, I mean, personally, I think they're paid a ridiculous sum of money. Um, their careers are short. They make a lot of money out of um, um, tele moving over into the media, the crossover into the media um, for, to further their careers and their, their lifetimes. And they have a certain amount of celebrity status but they're also in a very strong position to make political statements um, as they did with, the, as I talked about with the Black Lives Matter um, that all erupted. So they are very conscious as to what is happening. And there's always a degree of respect. You know, there's, there's always a minute, a, a, a minute's applause. If they want to celebrate somebody's life who's died, they were very thankful for the NHS and it was very genuinely meant. Um, they are, it's it is but it is an industry and it's an industry yes it involves people who are highly paid but we could we could look at any of the other big um multinational corporations that aren't involved in sport they are also making money and would they be being asked to support um poverty in other countries you know in other countries so i think we have to look at it and and detach the fact that they are sports and personalities from the fact that it's actually the corporation, it's big corporations that should be being called upon to, um, to support the um, uh, countries which are less, um, oh, I've lost the word, um, less successful, um, have got a lot of poverty. Now, I'm, I, what comes to mind though, is that the power of sport is there um, at a level where kids will kick around anything they can, this notion of kicking a ball or throwing a ball, even if they haven't got a proper ball, they will construct one so that they can play, play the game. 
And a lot of this is linked back to colonialism and the countries, you look at the countries that provide the, uh, the, the greatest cricketers in the world, the Indian Premier League that's taking place at the moment, is keeping the nation together because sport is such an inherent part of everyday life. Um, and, and it is what occupies people when they've got, whether they're, whether they're hungry or not, the children particularly will go out and play and will will compete against each other. Um, so I think that in terms of um, providing for it, it's something that is far wider than that. I mean, if we look at a corporation like um, um, Bill Gates um, provisions and the charitable work that a lot of these organizations do, the funding of the that is going to be put forward for the vaccinations for once the vaccine's been found for COVID. I mean, all of those sorts of things are co con uh, contributions to um, this debate. Um, and as to the um, second question, I'm not sure where this quote comes from. I don't know um, where uh, I think that there is a political move. Um, it leads on from that previous point about um, children and, and an inherent love of sport and, and kicking balls around that um, you have um, large, num uh, large proportions of the population are interested in competition. They want to see competition and it fills that void in their lives. It's, a, it's, it's part of the culture of the countries in, in, in either in spectator um, and following football teams or sports teams, or it's in the um, um, uh, oh, I've lost where I'm going with this. Um, dear. So we um, go to the next. Oh yes, yeah, to the to, to so that the government realizes that sport because sport plays such an important part in everyday life that they want to actually make sure that that is possible. And of course, it was very evident during the pandemic that that different governments in different countries put restrictions on the amount of exercise and participation in things. And in some countries, they still aren't yet back to any form of normality in terms of being allowed to go out um, and so um, I think that there is that that feeling that it's it's something it's it's a little bit of sugar to encourage people to return to normality some form of normality that they can actually watch something which doesn't although it's not the same as it was before the game itself the game of football the match is the same um, and it's a, it's a match between two teams of players. Um, Kevin has just told us that the quote is from 1984. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Um, I thought, I, when I read it, I thought it might have been, but then yeah. I couldn't recognize the, um, the, the bit about the plains of Argentina mm. in it. So that's what threw me. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Julie, um, uh, perhaps you remember your question for Jeff uh, that you typed in. Do you want to share it with us, or do you want me to read it myself? Yeah. Now, I was I, I was going to ask you because um, it, it reminded me of um, uh, one cruise that I did um, as a as a lecturer and hosting tables and that all those kind of tensions and. Um, and it also, funnily enough, reminded me of another kind of table where I spent some time doing research, which is a blackjack table, because um, I, I spent um, a whole period of field work actually um, basically playing blackjack in, in casinos. And uh, that is another table that is fraught with um, all kinds of undercurrents and uh, tensions and, you know, um, prickliness. Um, but but there, um, the conflict is much nearer the surface. Do you know, it's it sort of, um, it, it comes out, it, it, it kind of, it, there is not that same requirement, I suppose, to be nice and polite. And, you know, it's a much more kind of agonistic kind of a setup. And, and I wondered um, if in 
Jeff's experience, I mean, all those tales, there must have been occasions when things just kind of erupted. And, you know, what I just wanted to know about, was there conflict, outright kind of um, uh, conflict? And, and if so, how, how would you manage it at the same time as maintaining this kind of, you know, um, politesse, you know, kind of atmosphere? I was um, hoping you'd ask me about my policy on splitting eights. Um, if we're going to talk about sitting around a blackjack table, um, <laughs> but which I have spent a lot of time around blackjack tables, and I've oftentimes made that comparison between the hosted dinner table and blackjack, where in a blackjack table, you have a common enemy, um, which is the dealer. And so people are hyper inflating notions of wealth and risk and confidence and uh, pain around that table. So around a blackjack table, as you know, and you've written about, you see the whole scope of human emotion from joy to despair, to success, to defeat, um, to sometimes very much damaging. And there people are able to come and go as they, as they like. In this particular table setup, um, it's considered very bad form if you leave before the dealer has dealt his final, final meal. Um, much of the conflict comes to, uh, that happens. And I'd say that maybe to be generous, I'd say there's a conflict uh, 90 to 95% of the, of the meals. Um, there's an undercurrent. There's oftentimes conflict between uh, domestic partners um, that then the rest of the table have to evaluate what that is. For instance, it's not uncommon to have one partner speak over the other partner. Um, oftentimes, if it's a woman speaking over a man in this situation, that is a different level of combativeness from the rest of the group than if it's a man speaking over a woman. Um, there's very oftentimes very disparaging things that are said about the nationalities that people come from. Um, I have always tried to bring up issues of wealth and equality at these tables, especially when it's related to visiting destinations that have a higher poverty uh, quotient, so to speak, than, than, than others. And that can create a lot of conflict. I remember um, after leaving Brazil once, after leaving Rio, we were, we were talking about poverty and a woman said to me, um, how, can I, how can I help? How can I help alleviate this poverty? And um, I said, you can do exactly what you do to help the poor people in your, at your home, the way that you help there. And that started an eruption because obviously she had not done anything to care about the poor people in her own area. And that started conflict. Um, I am very happy not to be on a cruise ship right now in elections, US election season. Um, you see uh, both sides of a, of a political question and you see people being very mean towards each other. Probably the most significant source of tension, tension, tension at these tables is about racism. Um, when somebody says something that is absolutely abhorrent and how do you manage that and how do others respond to that. And I oftentimes have taken a different approach than I would in my personal life. And I listen and I let it play out because um, I want to learn about some of these opinions that are there. And eventually you just have to, someone has to excuse themselves and leave. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of conflict. It's, uh, it's about my role in that situation is about trying to diffuse the conflict before it gets uh, bad, before it gets worse. So yes. Um, every, I've seen every level of conflict um, uh, possible at these tables, but also great joy, also great joy, also tremendous joy. Every, there was a, there, there are two quotes about dinner that I've always loved. One of them was in my high school above the dining room and it said, let us strive mightily, but eat and drink as friends. And the other is an old Italian saying that translates into at the table, one never grow, grows old. And so I try to start with one and finish with the other at these at these dinners. Um, I would perhaps like to reshape this question um, uh, that Julie asked and, and asked something of Julie. Um, so Jeff mentioned that this small talk uh, over dinner and small talk is a particular kind of art, it seems to me. And uh, I very much enjoy and it's very often class related, I would say, especially in, in the UK. 
uh, you see it constantly, especially, you know, kind of these uh, remnants of ar aristocracy who have to master the small talk that they have to constantly engage with. And they sort of, it confirms certain class. So I really appreciate these moments of the awkward moments. Um, but it also uh, tells us that, you know, that there are these constantly these structures that uh, aim to control encounter and to shape encounter, how encounter happens. And then uh, Julie's image was so striking because it's a, a kind of a encounter beyond human control. And there is this constant um, control of other species in kind of encounter with, between humans and others and non-humans. Um, so uh, I guess my question is, you know, how do we, can we ever kind of get away from this uh, sort of habitual sort of, uh, it's, it's not just desire, but it's kind of a, an impulse to control other species. Can we sort of uh, reconfigure ourselves um, as humans so as not to approach others only through constant control? Well, thanks for that question, Zafir. I mean, th th this, is the, this is the thing that I'm kind of struggling with at the moment in a way, because um, uh, I, I, I see this desire, human desire to control um, as being, you know, the root cause of all our problems, really, and um, you know, and and it's um, it's something that, it, as I said at, at the end of, of my presentation, you know, it, about sort of thinking, you know, resituating ourselves in relationship to other species and and the planet, rather than you know being at the top in control, you know charitably human beings have referred to themselves as the stewards of you know the planet but um but but you know i mean that what is what is stewardship and um uh it's it, it is it is about control it is about making decisions on behalf of um other species in the interests of of our species and you know we have been a sort of super successful species but it's had an enormous cost and you know so I think that, that it, it demands a really radical rethink where where we we think of ourselves as part of nature rather than above nature and you know a species like others rather than a, a, you know a, a super species because we are ultimately um, affected by you know the fate of other species also impacts on us too I mean, in beekeeping, it's very interesting because um, you have a whole range of approaches to this from um, large commercial kinds of beekeepers who, um, you know, in, in, in many ways are, and, and, I, and I mentioned in, in, in the presentation, you know, the, the sort of industrialized pollination um, in, in, the, in the almond fields and, um, you know, adulteration of honey in, in commercial beekeeping and so on. I mean, there's terrible practices that kind of go on. Um, and, and from there, you go through these kind of different kinds of approaches to, to, um, to bees and our relationship with bees, which goes through the, the you know, hobby beekeepers that um, go some of them may be very kind of hands-on and very keen to intervene and manipulate right up to at the other end, you know, um, natural beekeepers who are very um, sort of minima minimize their, their intervention. Um, there was a brilliant film that uh, was nominated for an Oscar called Honeyland, um, which you may have seen, yes, uh, which is very much about that relationship with, you know, a wild beekeeper and 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 a, and a neighbor who um, kind of takes all the honey, you know. I, I mean, and, and this is the thing, in many ways, we are so heavily compromised so that even in my motivation to, uh, to keep bees, um, you, you make yourself kind of complicit in some of the, um, uh, practices of control and, 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 and damage, you know, and, and 
beekeeping itself, the globalized trade in, in queen rearing and so on, you know, I mean, that has risen in response to um, not only commercial, but also kind of hobby beekeeping. So I, I think we're in a very interesting time now because I think, you know, we are more and more people are becoming aware of this, you know, range of different kinds of responses. And, um, and I think things like Extinction Rebellion and so on, you know, kind of uh, uh, putting that sort of um, issue much more uh, on, to, to the forefront. Um, but um, w when I look at the amount of weed killers that are being used in my neighbor's gardens, then I'm, <laughs> I'm not so sure, but yeah. Well, Honeyland is a, is a fantastic example, I think, of uh, how this sort of insatiable capitalism enters a very intimate interspecies relationship. Uh, it's, a, it's a Macedonian film. I warmly suggest it for all. Thanks for mentioning it. I think it's a perfect um, uh, sort of, uh, it, it can contribute a lot to our conversations on encounters. Um, I think, oh, well, I had a, a, a brief question from Kevin Webb. Uh, with a couple of quotes from Einstein. <laughs> and um, uh, I guess the question is whether he, he got it right that the distinction between the past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. And the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Um, I don't know, these are grand statements. Um, um, I mean, I sometimes like to play with a, with a few sort of uh, quotable grand statements and then when you have a longer text that's very easy to um, uh, to 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 kind of give caveat after caveat because of course uh, none of this works uh, across the board uh, and certainly you know not even for two people and certainly not across different kinds of social contexts uh, to, to qualify what time is and I really start my uh, uh, kind of research with this question that Roy Wagner posed, and uh, I repeated it so many times, you know, it's uh, whether, you know, time is something that, that is as such, that we can talk about as such, or whether we have to think about the diff qualitatively different kinds of time, of what we might call time. And there are certainly many words in, in the area where I worked on, uh, where I worked about time, um, or that, um, specify qualitatively different kinds of time. So in speaking of time, I was trying to think about specific relations that it expresses uh, uh, with these different words and in different situations, rather than to say something about time as such. And I think perhaps in, in, in that sense, uh, we are quite different from physicists. Tom, would you perhaps like to wrap this up a little bit with uh, with some of your well uh, um, it, it's it's i think i think maybe we can all do it um let, let's do it one by one I, I i'll start and then i'll ask um uh, everybody else to do it also and and um we had a very interesting question uh, which was uh, what are our favourite films? And just to, to get that get that one done first, I would say my three favourite films are Casablanca, Three Angry Men, and The Third Man. Um, but uh, to it's it, to to summarise our discussions, I think that we might think about um, the question of what constitutes and what is the context of a good society? What does a good society actually consist of? What does it mean? Um, and what kind of thoughts can we have about that in relation to some of the questions and issues that were uh, raised by um, uh, everybody? Um, so in the, in, in the first place, I would, I would say to Jeff, um, uh, who who argued that his encounters on the dining table uh, were a question of selling fantasies, and um, I absolutely right. And the question would be: Is 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 this, as it were, okay? Is it okay to sell fantasies? Is it okay to sell myths? And if it is, 
uh, why is it? And if it isn't, um, why is it not? And I, I suppose that the answer must be yes and no, because we do need fantasies and myths. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, I do know from talking to people in your industry uh, that uh, people who go on cruises have a great deal of political power, actually. Uh, and their fantasies do influence real people in real spaces and in real times. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, is, it is not wholly OK uh, to keep on, as it were, uh, the fantasy path. There comes a time when fantasies have to end and people have to be uh, faced uh, with something else, I suppose. I mean, in, in a sense, that's a question. Um, Linda, Linda's uh, 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 question that comes out of thinking about her, uh, about what she was talking about and, and what a good society is, is what what role exactly is she asked? What role does sport have uh, in making a good society? Um, and Julie and Suffet seem to, uh, 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 oh, not, uh, Jeff, sorry, Julie and Jeff are experts in blackjack. Um, some time ago, I did quite a lot of research in a Greyhound Racing Stadium in Haringey, and that, I can tell you, was one of the most sociable uh, uh, sporting occasions I've ever in in engaged in. Quite surprising, actually. And it was a great tragedy that this stadium in Haringey uh, was replaced by, uh, by a supermarket. Um, the, I would, uh, as far as uh, Julie's cross-species um, uh, uh, talk is, is concerned, I mean, I can only recommend uh, the, the, as I said, the, 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 the head of the Francis Crick Institute. I mean, the meaning of life and so on is really interesting as far as that is concerned. And he absolutely uh, talks about control uh, and uh, other words that we could use like colonialism, orientalism and all the rest of it uh, as being uh, actually uh, suicidal as far as cross-species uh, relations are concerned. Um, and the, the question that I always have for, for Suffet, and I think it's an important and a very, very difficult question, actually, is I've heard him say um, uh, uh, with, with profound seriousness that it's, it, it, it is absolutely necessary to understand both the coming together and the driving apart uh, of, of uh, groups um, of people uh, in Bosnia and to understand uh, uh, what we might call, um, you know, the nationalist impulse or something like this. So again, the uh, issue is uh, how do we get from those questions to the issue of good society and where might we find, what spaces might we find uh, the good society in and what times might we find and how does the this issue that was brought up in the chat about the past, present and future is terribly important because obviously the future must contain the past as well. Um, so these are the kind of things that I think that maybe we have uh, talked about. Thank you, Tom. Um, I mean, this question of you know a fantasy in relation to the good society is um, relates to a lot of what we are trying to sort of uh, problematize or decolonize uh, in terms of uh, kind of this knowledge production in anthropology and other other disciplines. Um, the this kind of uh, imagination that's very often produced as a matter of fact. You know, for other societies, uh, or it's kind of a fantasy of the other that's uh, that's then uh, kind of produced as knowledge, and um, uh, so the question is, you know, at once how to uh, kind of not only resist uh, this fantasy, which very much continues, I would say, in terms of, and this relates to our first question that uh, Rabia, I think, asked. Um, um, and, um, but it also, you know, how to allow ourselves, um, how to allow others to, to continue, you know, kind of their lives without our interventions, without the constant need to, to make everything known and make everything visible and, may, and control it in a way then. Um, and uh, so in a sense, it also suggests that this kind of encounter that the anthropologists, you know, desire that want with constantly, you know, with something unknown to find out, encounter that elucidates others, uh, is also quite problematic, and um, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, kind of uh, 
uh, some, you know, we should allow others to decide whether they would like something to be known or not. Uh, and, and, and ethnographies kind of produce knowledge almost as, as if, you know, it's accepted uh, across the board that it's something that everybody wants. And I, I know certainly in my ethnography that, you know, some things that, that I know uh, my interlocutors didn't want to be revealed about their uh, lives, about the number of returnees to the villages in Gatsko, which the state could use to control them um, and so on, um, I sort of didn't speak about. And this was, you know, so, so it's constantly kind of uh, an engagement with really the life words, life worlds of our interlocutors, I would say. Jeff. Um, no, I think that brings us to the end of our time today. And I think that those questions that uh, you asked there at the end, uh, Tom and Safet, um, are going to provide us with future opportunities to discuss these uh, in our Xenia series that uh, we, we do that will actually have a very special speaker and a book launch uh, next week. Um, and I encourage everybody to look at xeniaseries.com. The link is in the, in the chat. Um, I think that we have some things to discuss and to look deeper in here. Um, I know that life for me has always been about weaving a blanket with some threads of fantasy and some threads of reality and uh, seeing where they can where they can clothe us in our uh, in, in wonderful warmth of experience. Um, but yeah, I th thank you guys for doing this today. Thank you all for, for being here and for, for watching us. This was a lot of fun today. I'm honored to be with my friends here talking about these, these wonderful things on what is a beautiful morning still in New Hampshire. And thank you very much, Danny and Stephanie, also for all your support in making this panel happen. And to all the attendees, I think this will close in a few seconds. Um, uh, wonderful uh, to see the panelists. Hopefully next time we'll also see some of the questioners. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Linda.